So is coffee good for us or not? There have been troubling worries raised in the past, especially about the risks involving cancer, heart disease and the liver, but the research over the past couple of decades has completely flipped the script when it comes to coffee and our health. And this latest study finally puts to rest some of the most common concerns that I hear all of the time from my patients, especially when they're older. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. The biggest worry that most people have when it comes to coffee relates to the heart, and that's where this recently published clinical trial comes in. So what's the connection here? Well, coffee contains caffeine, and caffeine is a stimulant. Stimulants can be super useful. So caffeine, for instance, it boosts alertness, it increases exercise capacity, and it can enhance mood. But there are some other effects that cause the worry. Specifically, caffeine can elevate heart rate and blood pressure and we know that when it comes to the heart, we generally want to do the opposite. So that raises the question of whether drinking coffee is good for our hearts. It's something that doctors have been paying attention to for a long time. A research review published back in 2004, for instance, warned that we should be alert to the potential problems. The author made the alarming claim that caffeine use could account for 14% of all deaths from heart attacks and 20% from strokes. Claims like this caused doctors and other health experts to warn against coffee consumption, especially for those who have got heart conditions like irregular heartbeats. But evidence has been steadily building that this early assessment was wrong. Let's look at hypertension first. This is when blood pressure is elevated. And since caffeine raises blood pressure, at least in the short term, this is a key area to look at. So does regular coffee consumption increase our risks of hypertension? Well, a meta-analysis published in 2018 pulled together all of the existing evidence. Their assessment included 10 cohort studies with about 250,000 people. The findings were the opposite of what we might expect. Instead of seeing an increased risk of hypertension, coffee drinking was actually associated with a lower risk. Specifically, the risk of high blood pressure was cut by 2% for each additional cup of coffee per day compared to those who didn't drink coffee. But higher blood pressure in itself isn't really the worry at the end of the day. What high blood pressure can lead to, that's what we're concerned about. That extra stress on the heart and blood vessels is linked to dangerous conditions like plaque buildup, heart attacks and strokes. So we don't just want to look at studies on high blood pressure. It's important to look at the connection between coffee and heart problems like these. So when we do that, we find some surprises. A massive cohort study in 2009 involved over 80,000 women and lasted 24 years. It looked specifically at strokes strokes, and the researchers found that those who drank the most coffee had the lowest risk of having a stroke. For those who drank 2-3 to three cups of coffee per day, it was 19% lower than for non-coffee drinkers. Another large cohort study in the UK, published in 2022, investigated deaths from heart disease, and compared to those who didn't drink coffee, those who were consuming about 3 cups of coffee per day had a 17% lower death rate. Even for those who'd previously had a heart attack, drinking more coffee led to better outcomes. A Swedish study followed participants who had had a prior heart attack for up to 8 years, and those who drank more coffee had a 40% lower risk of dying from heart disease than those who drank no coffee. But what about the area of irregular heartbeats? It's commonly thought that caffeine made this more likely. And one of the more worrying types of irregular heartbeats is atrial fibrillation. This is where the top part is fibrillating, it's not functioning correctly, and blood slows down as it's passing through that part of the heart. And when it slows down, that's when the blood can clot, and then that clot is then ejected into the brain, causing a stroke. A meta-analysis examined seven observational studies involving over 100,000 people. It found that caffeine consumption wasn't associated with a greater risk of atrial fibrillation, which is really surprising. In fact, the researchers concluded that low-dose caffeine may even help guard against this condition. This finding was backed up by another meta-analysis and a large Danish cohort study that the clinical guidelines reference. And here is where we finally get back to the brand new study that I want to talk about. It looks specifically at patients who are already diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. These are the people whom doctors have often advised to stay clear of coffee and caffeine because these patients are at high risk. If we're going to see heart problems from coffee, this is the population where we'd see it. So the people in the study were divided into two groups, daily and non-daily coffee drinkers. They kept track to see how many experienced strokes, heart attacks and heart failure or death due to heart problems. And here's what they discovered. The risk for serious heart problems was 23% lower for daily coffee drinkers. So you can see why I say this study as the final nail in the coffin for worries about coffee and heart problems. This is a population where traditionally we've had the most concern about the effects of coffee and the study found that it actually helps. But I want to add three important cautions. 
First, the timing of our coffee intake has a huge impact on our health, as does the amount. We can certainly have too much caffeine, and I'll come back to the right timing and dose in a moment. The second caution has to do with cholesterol. We've got research of over 132,000 adults showing no association between the impact of filtered coffee and total cholesterol. But filtered coffee turns out to be the key qualifier here. With unfiltered coffee, we do see an increase in cholesterol levels, including LDL cholesterol, so clearly not what we want. So research supports avoiding unfiltered coffee. This means steering clear, for instance, of a French press. It's also worth considering using filter paper if you use an espresso machine. And the final caution is that we need to be careful about what we add to our coffee. If we're adding cream and sugar, we can offset coffee's positive effects. So for instance, drinking black coffee is associated with lower weight, but adding sugar to your coffee is connected to gaining weight in a recent study. And before we look into when to drink coffee and the right amount that's best for our health, we need to look at two other health concerns. Heart health is what most people think of when it first comes to coffee, but that isn't the only concern. Sometimes my patients also ask about liver health or cancer. So is there anything that we need to worry about in these areas? The concern about the liver is this. Caffeine is processed and broken down by the liver, so it makes sense that having too much could strain the liver, possibly leading to damage over time. That's the theory, but what has the research found? A large review published in the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hepatology notes that drinking two or more cups of coffee per day improves liver function. It also protects against the progression of almost all forms of liver disease. A more recent analysis of nearly 500,000 participants in the UK Biobank with a medium follow-up of almost 11 years reinforces these conclusions. Researchers observed a 21% lower risk of chronic liver disease and a 49% reduction in death from this condition when comparing regular coffee drinkers to non-drinkers. The authors of another meta-analysis found the connection between regular coffee consumption and liver health so strong that they even wrote, we found caffeine to be a potential drug for preventing and treating various liver diseases. In other words, they said that caffeine is like medicine for the liver. That's the exact opposite of being a damaging strain on the liver. Okay, but what about cancer? There have been some concerns about this in the past. For instance, a broad study tried to trace the connections between cancer rates on a population level and the amount of coffee consumed in particular countries. The authors detected an association between higher coffee intake and pancreatic and prostate cancers. The World Health Organization even listed coffee as potentially carcinogenic in 1991, but a re-evaluation of more recent evidence caused them to reverse course in 2016. They said the evidence did not show a risk of cancer. But more recent research has pushed things even further. Scientists combined the results from 28 individual meta-analyses. In other words, they looked at mountains of data. And their conclusion? The highest quality of evidence suggests that as coffee consumption goes up, the risk of developing liver or endometrial cancer goes down. Furthermore, they didn't find any solid evidence that coffee causes any type of cancer. A separate study looked specifically at coffee consumption on prostate cancer risk. Once again, higher coffee intakes were associated with lower risks of cancer. So for all of these areas, heart health, liver disease and cancer, we see a similar story. While we used to worry about the negative health impacts, more recent evidence keeps uncovering positive ones instead. But if we want to reap the most benefits from coffee, we need to use it properly, and this means paying attention to timing and quantity. So when should we drink coffee, and how much is safe? You'll find plenty of health influencers giving this advice. Why the first thing that you drink in the morning should absolutely not be coffee. So what's the logic behind this? Well, there are two main reasons given. First is that people claim that it can cause an unwanted rise in cortisol levels. Cortisol plays many important roles in the body, and one of them is helping you feel awake and alert. Cortisol levels naturally rise rapidly when we first wake up, peaking after about 30 minutes. But having too much over the long term causes negative impacts like weight gain, raised blood pressure, muscle weakness and osteoporosis. And yes, coffee can make your cortisol levels go up. That's why some people think it's better not to drink coffee right when you wake up because your cortisol levels are already at their highest levels. But this logic doesn't hold up and here's why. Coffee loses much of its power to elevate cortisol levels once our bodies get used to it. So after just five days of regular coffee consumption, people stopped having a cortisol response to their initial cup of coffee. 
So the first reason given to avoid early morning coffee is flawed. It doesn't appear to be a problem for our cortisol levels. The second reason relates to our adenosine levels. Adenosine helps to trigger sleepiness. It naturally builds up in the body during the day. Caffeine blocks adenosine, which is why it helps us keep awake. And the theory here is that when we wake up, our adenosine levels are at their lowest. So caffeine won't have much, if any, benefit because there's hardly any adenosine to block. But there are two problems here. First, blocking adenosine isn't the only impact of coffee. So even if it isn't effective for this purpose first thing in the morning, it could still make sense to drink coffee right away. Second is that caffeine, it stays in your system for a really long time. So its effects in blocking adenosine continue long after you drink it. This means delaying it a little bit isn't going to make any difference. In fact, it gives us a reason not to delay coffee in the morning. The average half-life of caffeine in the human body is about five hours. This means that after 5 hours, you'll still have 50% of the caffeine in your system. After 10 hours, it would be 25%, and after 15 hours, 12.5% would remain. And since caffeine is a stimulant, it affects your sleep. So some people will say that caffeine doesn't affect their sleep, and that they can still get to sleep easily, even if they have a coffee late at night. And sure, you might be able to get to sleep, but caffeine still affects the quality of your sleep, so you likely won't be as rested when you wake up in the morning. So it makes sense to have our coffee earlier in the day to avoid degrading our sleep quality. So I tell my patients to aim to have their last cup of coffee within four hours of waking up. Plus in January of this year 2025, published in the European Heart Journal, a study of more than 40,000 adults suggests that drinking coffee in the morning might be more strongly associated with a lower risk of death rather than drinking coffee later in the day. And a large 2024 review looked at the current evidence regarding an afternoon crash. It concluded that there's no evidence of this claim. So if you want to delay your first cup of coffee by a couple of hours, because of what you've heard an influencer say, that's entirely your call, but I wouldn't have any more caffeine after four hours of waking up. But what about quantity? What's the right amount of coffee to gain its benefits without having too much? Well, the US Food and Drug Administration set a level of 400 milligrams of caffeine for healthy adults as an amount generally not associated with negative effects. So what does that translate to in terms of cups of coffee? Well, the amount of caffeine in coffee, it varies widely. So for instance, there might be as little as 80 milligrams, but it can go all the way up to 400 milligrams per cup. So if we look at how much coffee was used in the studies and what doctors recommend, having about two to three cups per day seems just right. At this level, for most people, we can lock in the benefits without risking any side effects. Plus, that was the intake that the authors of the new study on coffee and atrial fibrillation found. Two to three cups of coffee was associated with the lowest risk of heart attacks, strokes and deaths. But let me back up a bit. Earlier in the video, we talked about high blood pressure as a key risk factor for heart disease. And recent research has isolated a simple, effective exercise that's surprisingly powerful with its ability to lower blood pressure. So make sure to check out this next video here so that you can discover what this exercise is and how you can easily start doing it at home with no extra equipment needed.